occupied territories of bharat sorry i think it is uh, occupied territories of india uh, which i would put it and uh, when we talk of occupied territories of india uh, we need to understand that while we have disputes with some of our neighbors all over bulk of these territories are in jammu and kashmir when we talk of pakistan pakistan has occupied certain territories in jammu and kashmir but besides that we have only territorial dispute on sarkri which is a water body we don't have any major uh, uh, territorial dispute with pakistan outside jammu and kashmir and ladakh uh, when we talk of china china has a major dispute with us even on arunachal pradesh but most of the territory is with us china has made some small incursions but most of the occupied territories uh, uh, most of the territory that china disputes in himachal pradesh uttarakhand or arunachal is in our possession so the bulk of the territory that china has occupied as far as india is concerned is in ladakh similarly we have minor differences of on territorial uh, disputes with nepal we have certain delineation which has to be done with myanmar with bangladesh we have resolved our border dispute completely with sri lanka we have resolved it completely we have no disputes with maldives we do have no disputes with uh, thailand with which we share boundary we have no dispute with indonesia so all these countries with which we share either land boundary or maritime boundary we have delineated it and uh, more or less there is no dispute barring some small ones which i have told you as you know nepal was in picture so bulk of the dispute that we have the bulk of india's territory that have been occupied by foreign powers are in the former princely state of jammu and kashmir and which are now the union territories of jammu and kashmir and union territories of ladakh and this is of course the map that you know the new map of this particular region is the ut of ladakh and ut of jammu and kashmir but we need to understand as far as this territory is concerned there are parts which are occupied by pa pakistan there are parts which are occupied by china but very often people don't understand what is claimed by all see because occupation is different what is claimed is different and this is what i wanted to show you this particular map and this is what is very important the first map is what the state is today you have administered region you have a park administered park occupied kashmir park occupied ladakh you have indian administered or what you say what we call as jammu and kashmir and ladakh then you have the chinese controlled or what china has occupied uh, aksai chen etc now as far as we are concerned the entire jammu and kashmir entire ladakh is constitutionally legally our part and this is what we have shown it now what pakistan claims is pakistan claims the entire former princely state of jammu and kashmir as its territory barring those areas which the china claims and chinese claim of course are restricted to those areas which china occupied or claims somewhat in ladakh area so this four different as aspects we must understand clearly now this is how the former jammu and kashmir used to look like who has occupied what you i have generally explained it to you this is the area which you have occupied by pakistan you have which is divided into two parts one is known as uh, mirpur muzaffarabad which pakistan likes to call it ajk or azad jammu and kashmir now the new nomenclature for this is pakistan occupied jammu and kashmir and this area which is now gilgit baltistan we can call it pakistan occupied territory of ladakh then here you have the shaks gaon valley which has been ceded by pakistan to china this is aksai chen area including them chok you have siachen glacier here which pakistan contests we have an active border here and this is again with india's of control so this is how the former map of jammu and kashmir looks like before the division but there is a big difference you have certain territories which are under pakistan's occupation there are certain territories under china's occupation but the two occupations the two occupation by foreign powers is slightly different so pakistan with pakistan we have a dispute in ladakh and jammu which is perceived as a territorial dispute because as i showed you pakistan claims virtually the entire territory barring those which china claims of course that is also they have relinquished after 63 before 63 they used to claim even that territory that is after sino pak agreement but with china the dispute is a boundary dispute china does not say that entire jammu and kashmir and ladakh belongs to us china only says that the boundary goes from here and we say boundary goes from here 
the total area which is under pakistan's occupation is over 78000 square kilometers whereas the total area which is under chinese occupation is over 37000 square kilometers in addition over 5000 square kilometers of shaksgam valley has also been ceded uh, by pakistan to china under their sino pak agreement of 1963 now why i am giving approximates is there are certain areas where the boundary the line of control line of actual control are not delineated properly i'll come to that subsequently now pakistan has a territory which is got a vibrant population it's got over 5 million people living here whereas the territory which china has occupied is virtually uninhabited there is of course a small isolated village of demchok and then certain pla stations which have come up but what is even more important is that the line of control with pakistan from the international border up to a point which is known as 9842 nj9842 from where siachen glacier emanates is delineated on map and demarcated on ground that means you know territory beyond that is ours but this is what is the line of control that means the position where the two respective forces are there is identified and clearly delineated but with china the line of actual control is neither delineated on map nor demarcated on ground as a result there are different perceptions we believe that line of actual control passes through this area they believe line of actual control passes through this area and as a result you have what is known as overlapping patrols where their patrols come into our territory and our patrols go and this leads to skirmishes tensions and now what we have seen is after so many decades we have had loss of lives and open confrontation now the territory which pakistan has and first i'll try to talk about this pakistan occupied jammu and kashmir and ladakh this pakistan has divided into two parts one is what is what i like to call as meepur muzaffarabad or what we can call pakistan occupied jammu and kashmir and the other is what is gilgit baltistan or pakistan occupied territory of ladakh so we have two different nomenclatures for the two territories meepur muzaffarabad is less than 15% of the territory under pakistan's occupation gilgit baltistan is more than 85% of the territory Gilgit Baltistan has less than 30% of the population whereas Meerpur Muzaffarabad has more than 70% of the population but what is important is that Pakistan tries to project Meerpur Muzaffarabad as a independent sovereign entity it, it has given an external facade of an independence it's called AJK Azad Jammu and Kashmir whereas Gilgit Baltistan has been treated as a virtual colony had no constitutional status till 2009 and till recently enjoyed no democratic institutions next meerpur muzaffarabad has by and large been culturally assimilated into pakistan whereas gilgit baltistan has a very very rich pre islamic culture and enormous linguistic and cultural diversity now both these territories are being infiltrated by radical islamists in fact large number of uh, insurgent outfits have their camps in meerpur muzaffarabad you have lashkar e toiba jamaat ud dawa etc you know all these infiltrations that take place Uh, virtually in jammu and kashmir come from these places and there are camps all over in meerpur muzaffarabad area in gilgit baltistan also the radical islam is making its move and tehreek e taliban pakistan is making its pre presence during kargil wal lashkar e taiba and its cadres were encouraged and as a result the sectarian conflict in this particular area has become aggravated what is even more important is that in meerpur muzaffarabad state subject rule is still inapplicable consequently anybody from pakistan cannot constitutionally become a citizen of this area cannot go and settle down there but in gilgit baltistan in 70s zulfikar ali bhutto had removed the state subject rule and as a result there is a huge migration of pakistanis coming and settling down in gilgit baltistan thereby changing the demography of this region and consequently you will see that the population has grown inordinately in gilgit baltistan whereas it's not grown so in meerpur muzaffarabad what is even more important is that the latest census which has taken place in pakistan the entire pakistan's figures have been declared even meerpur muzaffarabad's figures have been declared but the figures for gilgit baltistan have still not been declared the reason is the inordinate increase will be difficult to justify and that will cause discontent 
In Mirpur, Muzaffarabad, Pakistan built what is known as Bhasha Dam, which has inundated large tracts of this territory, and the irrigation water is supplied to Pakistan. This area has been inundated to provide irrigation water to Pakistan. The territory that has been flooded is our territory, constitutionally, legally, but the benefits are being derived by Pakistani. Now, similarly, in Gilgit, Baltistan, now they are actually constructing Bhasha Dam, which will again inundate territory in Gilgit, Baltistan, but will provide irrigation facilities and power to Pakistan. As a result, what you find is that there is resentment against in both these territories against Pakistan, but the resentment in Mirpur, Muzaffarabad has been relatively muted in, in terms of percentage of population. In Gilgit, Baltistan, the resentment against Pakistan has been far more intense and far more large scale. I'll now briefly cover POJK, what is known as Pakistan Occupied Jammu and Kashmir or Mirpur Muzaffarabad. As I said, it is called Azad Jammu and Kashmir by Pakistan. We did not have an official term for this territory till 5th August 2019. Now restructuring of Jammu and Kashmir has now given it a clear cut term that Pakistan Occupied Jammu and Kashmir is what Pakistan calls AJK. Earlier we had an ambiguity. It's been divided into three divisions. Each division, the districts are given here. You can see it. As I said, Pakistanis cannot become legally citizens of this part. And they always say a picture is worth a thousand words. So you need to see how this area looks. This is, of course, Mangala Dam. This is the dam which I told submerged a territory. It submerged a city. There was a city called Mirpur which got completely submerged and a new Mirpur city was constructed. So this is very important. Why this is important is because this Mirpur city, the, the people who lived here, Mirpuris, used to travel across the world. They were actually the stokers. The stokers in steamships used to be those who used to lift coal and throw it into the furnace. So these stokers were from Mirpur because, as you know, between First World War and Second World War, most of the ships that plied the oceans were steamships fired by coal. And at that point of time, Hindus had a taboo about going across oceans. They thought they would lose their faith. So people were reluctant. So Muslims were more keen and the people from this part went there and they traveled all over the world. They had seen the world. So what happened when this dam was built, <clears throat> their city got submerged, they got compensation and a new city was created. They had no emotional bonding for the new place where they had gone. Since already they had seen the world, they started migrating. And today you have a huge Mirpuri diaspora in UK. And that's why you find that in UK, very often you have Kashmiri protests against India. This is led by this Mirpuri diaspora, led by Lord Nazir and all these people. They are from Mirpur. This is the area. This is another picture of Mirpur, Muzaffarabad, just to give you an idea how this terrain looks. This is the map of Mirpur, Muzaffarabad. As I said, it has a facade of independence. It has its prime minister. It has its president. But how independent it is, you will come to know that the prime minister of this particular area has been charged with sedition by Pakistan for listening to a speech by Nawaz Sharif. So he has been charged by sedition. So this is the head. In the past, president of this area have been arrested and put behind bars. This area also has an assembly which has 45 directly elected and 8 indirectly elected members. Now, this is interesting. Out of these 45 directly elected members, only 33 get elected from here. Now, six seats are reserved for people who have migrated from Kashmir and live in the rest of Pakistan. And similarly, six seats are reserved for people from Jammu region who have migrated from this area and live in the rest of Pakistan. Now, why I'm telling this is important is because we also have a large Kashmiri Pandit population living in the rest of India. We could also have a provision. We also have people who have migrated from POJK and are living in different parts of India. We could also have a provision for an assembly seats for them. The eight indirectly selected elected seats, five are for ladies, one each for cleric, one is for people abroad and one is for technocrat. It has its own higher judiciary, Supreme Court, High Court, etc. But the judgment given by its Supreme Court has often been turned by Pakistani Supreme Court, which has no jurisdiction over it. Now, they have passed recently a 13th Amendment, which has further increased Islamabad's control over this particular region. And virtually anything and everything that is important is controlled from Pakistani capital. This is a picture of this place as just to show you how uh, scenic this region is and how good it is. This is the city of Muzaffarabad. You can see there's a bend in the river. You can see this is again Neelam Valley, a picture. 
the languages that are spoken in this part are not spoken in Pakistan by and large. But what is important is that the Kashmiri language is spoken by a very, very minuscule part of this region. Kashmiri language is spoken by a very, very small section of people only in Neelam districts. The languages which are spoken mostly in this part are Pahari Potwari languages, which are three uh, different dialects. One is Mirpuri, the other is Pahari, and the third is Potwari. Besides this, Hindko language is spoken, which is also spoken in Hazara division of Khabar Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan, like Abbottabad, Manshera, Haripur, these districts. And the single largest pop language spoken is Gurjari or Gojari, like which is spoken in Rajasthan, Himachal, and other parts of India. The Gujars who speak, this is spoken. Sheena is also spoken, which is spoken in Gilgit Baltistan. Some people speak Pashto which is spoken in Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. And there is also another unique language called Kundal Shahi, which is spoken in a single village in Neelam Valley, where Kundal Shahi language is spoken. This is a very, very unique language. What is even more important is that there are a lot of religious places in this particular area, which uh, have been abandoned because all Hindus and Sikhs actually left this particular place. So there are a large number of Gurdwaras and temples which have been abandoned. Some have been flooded as part of Mirpur's inundation. But what is most important for us is Sharda Peet. Sharda Peet was a seat of learning. If you go back to ancient India and you read, Adi Shankaracharya was accepted as Jagat Guru only once he was acknowledged by the pundits in Sharda Peet as Jagat Guru. So Adi Shankaracharya came all the way from Kerala to Sharda Peet. And not only that, subsequently, if you read the account by Vinsang or by Ibn Battuta, they all talk of Sharda Peet as one of the highest centers of learning. Unfortunately, post 47, this lie dilapidated and in ruins. Very recently, I think just two days back, Nidhiji told me that somebody went there, performed a puja. Ravindra Panditaji shared a video of that. For the first time, I think since 47, 48, people went and did puja and marked a swastika symbol there. So welcome thing. We are saying that we also need to have probably a Kartarpur corridor sort of a thing till we occupy this territory, which will eventually come to us someday. But pending that, we need to have something so that people from India can go to this spiritual land of theirs, which has been traditionally ours, which has always been our part. But as I said, Slowly and slowly, the resentment against Pakistan's occupation is increasing and people are uh, been protesting. This is one of the protest rally where people are demanding independence and merger of Gilgit Baltistan with this so-called AJK. These are, again, some of the pictures. You can see women in the forefront. This is another rally in Muzaffarabad. Another rally. This is a picture of market in Muzaffarabad, just to give you an idea how the town or city looks like. Now I'll come to Gilgit Baltistan. When we used to say that Jammu and Kashmir, the former Jammu and Kashmir was a strategically a very, very important region. The most significant part of this Jammu and Kashmir was Gilgit Baltistan. Kashmir Valley is important, but it's not as important strategically as Gilgit Baltistan is. This is the region which dominates all the landmass around it. And it's an extremely scenic beauty. You can see how beautiful this place looks like. These are some of the pictures just for your view. This is Atabad Raid, which was created because of glacial lake outbursts and certain landslide where a water stream has been blocked and an artificial lake has been created. This is the Karakoram Highway, which connects China to Pakistan. As I said, if Gilgit Baltistan was with us, China and Pakistan would have had no connectivity between themselves. A water canal. This is Nanga Parvat, one of the highest peaks. As I said, it is strategically the most significant part of former Jammu and Kashmir. It connects Pakistan to China. It dominates access to Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, and through them to Central Asia. Bulk of Pakistan's freshwater resources emanate from this region. It is extremely rich in mineral resources, has enormous tourism potential, and has immense hydropower potential. This is, of course, Gilgit uh, 
runway just next to the runway one of the aeroplane actually crashed last year and this is a picture of that it's divided into 14 districts three divisions are there gilgit baltistan and daimar divisions it's surrounded one side by zinjiang province zinjiar ugur autonomous region as it is called wakan corridor of afghanistan chitral and kohistan districts of pakistan besides other parts of pojk and other parts of ladakh what is important is that even kohistan and chitral at some stage were under the suzerainty of maharaja of jammu and kashmir unfortunately we have not claimed these areas but uh, there have been demands in gilgit baltistan that these areas must be returned back to gilgit baltistan what is important is that eight out of world's 25 highest peaks are located in this region which includes k2 godwin austin the second highest peak in the world now this is regrettable that very often you will find in indian textbooks that the highest indian peak is kanchenjunga as if k2 godwin austin does not belong to us the fact is the highest peak on indian territory is k2 godwin austin kanchenjunga is third highest k2 is the second highest peak three longest glaciers outside polar region are in this part of the world 5000 square kilometer wide deosai plateau at an altitude of 4115 meters is the second highest plateau in the world and this is some of the pictures of deosai plateau you can see at 4000 meters plus you have this sort of a flat ground again a picture of deosai plateau so this is a very very important place the people here now this we need to understand that gilgit baltistan traditionally has not been one territory there were two parts one was dardistan and one was baltistan dardic people have been talked of in mahabharat etc because these people speak languages which are known as dardic languages these are of indo aryan and iranian origin shina domaki kohistani khowar waki these are languages which are hardly spoken anywhere else in pakistan Besides this, they also have a language called Brushushki, which is a language isolate. And as you know, language isolate is a language which has no brother, sister, cousins. It's the only language of its own type, of its own family. So Brushushki is there, which is spoken in Hunza and Yasin Valley. This is a language isolate. People in Baltistan are quite different. They are Mongoloids, whereas people in Gilgit region are Dardic, who are Aryans. So in Baltistan, people speak Balti language, which is similar to what is spoken in Kargil or is spoken in Leh. It's actually, uh, it's a language of the Tibetan group and people are of Tibetan and Mongoloid stock, as I said. Today, virtually the entire region is 100% Muslim. But Islam came into this particular area from different times, from different regions. And as a result, you have different sects. In Hunza, which is right in the north, the people believe in Ismaili Shia faith. They are the followers of His Highness Aga Khan. In Nagar and Eastern Gilgit, people follow Twelver Shia. What we call Shia normally is actually one sub-branch of Shia Islam, that is Twelver Shia or Ithna Sharia. People down south, near Daimar, follow Sunni Islam. In Baltistan, most of the people are Shia faith. But there is also a smaller people who follow a Noor Bakshi faith, which is neither Shia nor Sunni. And this Noor Bakshi faith is again not found anywhere else in the world except in this part. Some people are on our side of the line of control. If you go to Turtok, Pyagshe, Bordan, etc. Or where the Siachen Brigade is located, Partapur, you will find people following Noor Bakshi sect. Now with the increase in fissures across the globe between different sects of Islam, sectarian fissures have become grave even in this part of the world. These are some of the pictures. You can see picture of Hunza Valley. Early history. Why I am talking of early history is because at this point of time, Pakistan is trying to make Gilgit Baltistan the fifth province of its own. And what it has been trying to advocate is that Gilgit Baltistan has never been part of Jammu and Kashmir historically. He says it's an artificial construct which the British has created. Nothing could be farther from truth. Gilgit Baltistan has not only been part of Jammu and Kashmir, it has been an integral part of India whenever there was a strong empire in India. It was part of the Mauryan Empire. Ashoka introduced Buddhism here. Gilgit city is identified today by a rock carving of Lord Buddha, which is just outside Gilgit city. It was part of the Kushan Empire, like rest of the Jammu and Kashmir. 
Kanishka and Hovishka's coins are even today extracted in this part of the world. Similarly, when Kashmir had independent kingdoms, the largest and most powerful Kashmiri king, Lalita Ditya, had Gilgit Baltistan as his territory. His empire extended all the way from Kyrgyzstan to down below Jain. So he was the mightiest king. And his subsequent successors, Karkota dynasty, also had Gilgit Baltistan as their part. Subsequently, when Muslim rulers came, Gilgit Baltistan was again part of Kashmiri King Shihabuddin's kingdom. Then, when the Mughal Empire came, Shah Jahan captured Baltistan in 1637. Later, his uh, governor captured even Gilgit. So, Mughal rule continued in Gilgit Baltistan and rest of Jammu and Kashmir till 1753 when Afghans captured it. But like rest of India, whenever central authority was weak, the peripheral states broke through. So when central authority in Jammu and Kashmir or in India was weak, Gilgit Baltistan separate smaller, smaller states fragmented and emerged. Of course, when Mughal rule was replaced by Afghan rules, there was huge tyranny and people started protesting against the tyrannical rules of Afghans. And the people from this area approached Maharaja Ranjit Singh that please help us provide us liberation from this tyrannical Afghan rule. And Maharaja Ranjit Singh himself led the army and captured Srinagar in 1899. They also controlled Skardu, Astor and Kohistan. Meanwhile, Maharaja Ranjit Singh's vassal, Maharaja Gulab Singh, who was the ruler of Jammu, his general, General Zoravar Singh captured Leh and Baltistan for Maharaja Gulab Singh. And then, of course, subsequently, Zoravar Singh went and captured parts of Tibet, and he died in the finally fighting in Tibet, in Tibetan territory. Meanwhile, Colonel Nathesha, who was uh, the commander in chief of the Sikh governor in Kashmir, also captured Gilgit and surrounding areas. But after Maharaja Ranjit Singh's death, when this part became, Maharaja Gulab Singh became a sovereign ruler of Jammu, uh, Kashmir. This entire state, including Gilgit Baltistan, came under his sovereignty, his rule. And he became the undisputed ruler of this particular part. It is at this stage that in 1870s, when Russia started expanding eastward, the Tsars started capturing territory in east, the British started getting concerned about Russian movement to this particular area. And that is when Russia, British tried to create what is known as Gilgit Agency. Gilgit Agency was a small area, north bank of uh, Indus, or right bank of Indus as they call it, where they had certain uh, British officials who were positioned there to keep an eye on what the so Russians are doing. And they also had certain small amount of troops with them, certain Kashmiri state forces were also positioned. But this agency was, as the Russian threat depleted, this agency was withdrawn in 1881. Then again, when the Russian threat again increased, they established this agency in 1889. But while this agency was established, Maharaja's forces, Maharaja's officials continued to stay in Gilgit. But in 1917, you had a Bolshevik revolution. And after Bolshevik revolution, after the First World War, the Soviet Union started expanding. And when the Soviet Union started expanding and it started moving into Central Asia, there was again a concern. And then they forced Maharaja to give certain territory on the right bank of Indus to Britishers on 60 year lease on March 26, 1935. As independence came, Britishers realized that they should not have this. So Gilgit agency was returned to Maharaja on 1st August 1947. And Maharaja appointed his chief of staff, Brigadier Gansar Singh, as the governor of this particular place. And then, of course, when Maharaja acceded to India, there was turbulence in this particular area. Certain sections of Maharaja's forces combined with Gilgit scouts and captured the governor, Brigadier Gansar Singh. And subsequently, the commander of Gilgit Scouts, Major Brown, hoisted Pakistan's flag on 4th November, and this area became part of Pakistan. Subsequently, after capturing Gilgit, 
in february because the winter had descended and it's not feasible to traverse from gilgit to baltistan in winters in february they attacked skardu skardu was defended by major shirjang thapa who had been promoted to lieutenant colonel with a small garrison and he held on to this garrison from february till august since the raiders could not capture skardu they bypassed skardu and moved to kargil they captured kargil they moved towards zanskar and they started moving towards leh and eventually indian army moved up took tanks up the zojila and cleared all these raiders from this particular area and recaptured unfortunately we could not link up with skardu and skardu garrison had to surrender on 14th august 1948 and consequently government of india accepted a ceasefire and then whatever territory remained with pakistan's control as on 1st january 1949 when the ceasefire came became this pakistan occupied territory both of ladakh as well as anj and k the control under pakistan pakistan initially appointed an ayab tehsildar to rule over this area who arrived in november 47 then they signed a karachi agreement with muslim conference a party that had no representative in gilgit baltistan but represented certain people from kashmir that agreement separated gilgit baltistan from rest of jammu and kashmir and placed it directly under the control of pakistani authorities and called it northern areas of pakistan in 1952 a joint secretary sitting in karachi thousands of kilometers away would control gilgit baltistan like any colonial power in 1963 they gave away part of this their, their territory shaksgam valley to china the people protested especially in hunza whose territory it was but no way 1967 for the first time they appointed a resident at gilgit 1971 they appointed created an advisory council in 1971 war we managed to liberate 804 square kilometers of this territory which is now with us so when you go to ladakh you must visit this territory which till 1971 was under pakistan's occupation this advisory council was subsequently converted to northern areas council in 1975 then to northern areas legislative council in 1999 it was only on 7th september 2009 that gilgit baltistan empowerment and self governance order was passed and this area which was till then called northern areas were renamed as gilgit baltistan which had been a long pending demand and a position of chief minister governor etc was created but these were only ceremonial posts they had no power with them and up subsequently of course gilgit baltistan order 2018 has been passed which has virtually made this area a de facto province of pakistan so whatever little autonomy they had has also been taken away from them consequently the people have been protesting now you can see a protest here this gentleman who is protesting is manzoor parwana of gilgit baltistan united movement they have been protesting seeking liberation from pakistani control these are some of the pictures this is another organization called balwaristan national front their organization their rallies their flag again protests what are the causes of alienation now one would ask why are they reluctant why are they unhappy with pakistan and this we need to understand firstly they have no political rights if you have to contest elections you have to accept that gilgit baltistan is a part of pakistan even the elected representatives have no real power so they are actually powerless so there is of course resentment more importantly what has happened is with the removal of state subject rule outsiders have started coming and flooding this area and as a result the local residents have become a minority in their own traditional areas and this you can see how the populations have increased the population has increased in this particular area inordinately between 98 and 2011 of course the recent census figures have not been declared for this reason even the government the government structures are dominated by outsiders the chief secretary is outsider the finance secretary is outsider the ig police is outsider even northern light infantry which was earlier gilgit scouts and had soldiers from this area now has outsiders there is an economic exploitation this area which is extremely rich in resources suffers from a stark poverty in fact this area has enormous gold reserves when maharaja was ruling the vassal states in this area used to pay their tribute to maharaja in gold dust they used to uh, 
uh, filter the river sands and take out gold dust from it, which they used to pay to Maharaja. They also has other mineral resources, including uranium uh, is being talked of. There are uh, enormous tourism potential, huge hydropower potential. There are 32 hydropower plants that are being planned here. Northern Indus Cascade, China is actually trying to build here with collaboration with Pakistan. A huge thousands of megawatts of electricity is planned to be generated. But despite this, you can see that a bridge which had broken in one of the floods, the women are still crossing with a child on two wires. Not only that, the area which provides water to rest of Pakistan, here people don't get water for two days, two weeks at a stretch. This is just last month. The road, you can see what the state of the road was. That road has been blocked so people are carrying their luggage and walking from Gilgit to Scarborough. Of course, one of the major problems in this particular area is of sectarian conflict. This is one of the Shia majority regions under Pakistan's control. And as a result, there is a Shia Sunni divide. Shias and Sunnis are clashing. There is attacks on Nurbakshis. There are attacks on Smilies. Taliban has made its ingress. So Shia Sunni conflict has also aggravated. The genesis of sectarian conflict is here nothing but a subset of what is happening in Pakistan. Because Pakistan was created on the basis of the fact that Muslims of the subcontinent are a separate nation. Now when you create a nation state premised on the belief that Muslims of the subcontinent are a separate nation, the next logical question is who is a Muslim? And Pakistan has been beset with this problem right from 1953. In 1953, Pakistan had anti Ahmadiyya rights. We are two serving majors of Pakistan army were killed, lynched to death. And then Pakistan instituted a commission to decide whether Ahmadiyyas are Muslims or not. It was called Munir Kayani Commission. Now that commission sat for 300 days and came to a conclusion that they interviewed 23 sets of ulema and asked them who is a Muslim. And they said that if we accept the definition as given by one set of ulema, we will have to declare all other 22, including ourselves, as non-Muslims. And they said since there is no unanimity on who is a Muslim, this commission is not in a position to decide whether Ahmadiyya is a Muslim or not. But subsequently, Pakistan chose the parliamentary means and declared the Ahmadiyyas as non-Muslims. The sectarian fault lines in Pakistan aggravated. And as a result, when Ziaul Haq came to power, he tried to bring in Sunni Deobandi Islam in Gilgit Baltistan. And there was protest by people. So he actually brought people from outside and carried out a massacre of Shias. Their villages were burned, their property was burned. Then, of course, the sectarian conflict started. And since then, there have been sectarian conflict virtually every now and then. When Zia died, his death anniversary, people celebrated. Then there was again a riot. In 2004-2005, for one entire academic year, no school or academic institution remained open because Shias and Sunnis protested. They said the textbooks do not represent our view of point. She has said that the picture of child praying shows is a different way than what we pray. So it gives a misconception. So there were huge problems. One full year this conflict went on. The Shia leadership under Aga Ziauddin tried to mediate. So he was shot that. There was again writing for weeks. There was a curfew. Then in March 2005, Inspector General of Police of Gilgit Baltistan was killed. And when I say Inspector General of Police, please remember, Inspector General of Police in Pakistan is the highest ranking police official in a province. So IGP Punjab is IGP. It is not like India where you now have hundreds of IGs in one state. You have 50 odd ADGs and some 20 odd DGs in a state. Like in India, also till 70s, we used to have only one IG in a state. So when IGP killed means the highest ranking. Subsequently, the buses which were coming, the Shias were made to get down and, uh, and shot dead. So sectarian conflict has been going on since then and goes on relentlessly. Deputy Speaker was killed. The judges were killed. There was a time when uh, uh, people, uh, foreigners were going on to Nanga Parvat at base camp of Nanga Parvat at 4,200 meters. Foreigners were killed, but their Shia guide was also killed. Similarly, army, colonel, captain, SSP, everyone has been killed. So this violence continues. And there have been times when people had to be airlifted. The tourists were stranded. They had to be airlifted. 
any protest, any sectarian killing that takes place in Pakistan, there is a reaction in this particular part. And this is, of course, a protest that you can see in Gilgit against killing of Hazaras in Quetta in Baluchistan. So what happens in Pakistan finds a reaction in this part of the world. Another factor is, as I said, that these people are very, very proud of their pre-Islamic culture, their ancient, very rich culture. They also have very interesting languages which are not spoken, spoken by very, very small groups. And what is happening is they feel that fundamentalism is eroding their pre-Islamic cultures. The languages spoken are not being promoted by Pakistan, so they are getting eroded. Uh, in Baltistan, there is an attempt to revive Tibetan culture and script. They say that Persian script doesn't represent our language properly. So in Skardu, the people have started writing in Tibetan script. People are desiring greater interaction with Leh and Kargil to revive common cultural identity. This is, of course, the picture of famous Gilgit Buddha I had talked about. You can see this is certain inscriptions. This is Manzur Parwana again asking for opening of Skargil. Kargil. You can see these are the Animals used for plowing of land, you can see swastik made on their neck, called Yandrum. This is a mosque, but you'll see swastik all over. This is Baltistan Student Federation flag, you can see swastik. This is, of course, another uh, Khanka, a religious place. You won't find this sort of mosque anywhere else in the world. This has a Tibetan, distinct Tibetan identity, culture. Here is again a mosque. You can see on top, on the reef, you have swastiks, the Grand Mosque of Kaplu. This is a ruler's headgear. You have more punk or the peacock feather. A distinct pre-Islamic cultural identity. Islam doesn't talk of peacock feather or things like that. Now, with the efforts of Jammu Kashmir Study Center, the territories under Jammu Kashmir's, uh, Pakistan's occupation are now well known. I have, I think, overshot the time, so I'll just quickly rush through the territories that are under Chinese occupation. So when we talk of territories under Chinese occupation, people say only Aksai Chin. But the fact is, there are more territories under Chinese occupation than Aksai Chin alone. Aksai Chin is this area, what you are seeing on the map. This is about 37,244 square kilometers, approximately, because as I said, line of actual control is not known. There's a Kunlun mountain ranges north of Aksai Chin, which separates it from Tarim Basin in Xinjiang province. It's an extremely inhospitable terrain, a high altitude desert, where altitude varies from 4,300 meters to 7,000 meters. Now you can imagine the lowest point is 4,300 meters, where an ordinary human being from Mumbai cannot go just and start living. You have to acclimatize before you can go there and start living. It comprises of many endoric basins. Endoric basins, as you know, geologically are those entities from where the water does not ingress. Water dies down slowly by evaporation. And consequently, a large number of salt water and soda water lakes have been created. Now, this soda water, when it evaporates, soda ash flies out. And it makes this area even more inhospitable because alkaline soil, as you know, does not promote agriculture or vegetation. There are certain rivers known as Karkash, Chipchap, Galwan River, of course, is now in news. Aksai Chin River, they are all there. They originate here. Currently, most of it is under Chinese occupation. Historically, it was eastern part of Ladakh. You can say it was not part of any ancient empire, but Ladakh collected tributes and taxes from traders, graziers, and salt collectors. Traders passed through it, tax they would pay to Ladakh. The graziers would go, they would also have to pay tax. Similarly, salt. There are a lot, salt, lot of salt water lakes, so salt used to be collected, so they also had to pay. But no troops, etc., were deployed there because it was an extremely inhospitable terrain for positioning troops or officials permanently was considered uneconomical, unwieldy. So as a result, it was used as a transit route between Tibet and Tarim Basin, that is Zijiang, by armies as well as traders. And Treaty of Tingmuzgang, which was signed between Ladakh and Tibet in 1684, put it under Aksai, Ladakh. It said that Aksai Chin is part of Ladakh. But despite this, what happened in 1717 when Zungar Khanate, which was in Xinjiang, captured Tibet, it actually passed through this territory. The Treaty of Chushul, which was passed, signed in 1942 between Tibet and Maharaja, also decided to stick to the old established frontiers. That is what it was, but it was unfortunately not mapped. Subsequently, the British proposed to China that we need to delineate the boundary. Chinese said there was no need. In 1848, Tibet formalized the border. 
the chinese official maps issued in 1853 1917 and 1919 accepted this border which we actually claim today the british first proposed a line called johnson line this was created by a geog uh, geographer who was actually in survey of india who had taken employment with maharaja he signed a johnson line which delineated maharaja's territory with pak chinese territory this johnson line was beyond what we claim today what india's map is today actually it went beyond and it was far north of the boundary line which we show on the map in fact north of it is a place called shahidullah where maharaja constructed a fort because of this Johnson line and positioned his troops there to collect taxes from traders etc who were coming but it was such an inhospitable area that uh, within a year he decided that it is not feasible to keep the soldiers there and they were withdrawn subsequently britishers decided that yes johnson line is non not defendable so they probably came to johnson ardag line which is the line on which indian border is defined this was actually a line which was modified johnson line modified by major general john ardag the director of military intelligence and as a result it is known as johnson ardag line subsequently britishers also proposed a macdonald mccartney line which was further inside but all these lines were proposed to china but no response was received from china and as a result till 1908 britishers would sometimes use macdonald mccartney line sometimes they'll use johnson ardag line but from 1911 onwards they have been using johnson ardag line 1917 to 1933 the postal atlas of china showed the boundary of china according to johnson ardag line but despite this the britishers never positioned soldiers and as a result in 1940 41 they were surprised to know that some soviet officials were carrying out survey in aksai chin and they were carrying out survey in aksai chin for whom they were doing it for sheng shikai who was a warlord in xinjiang so britishers protested since independence we have used this line to delineate our independent borders but again we also did not position soldiers and as a result we were some shocked to know that in 1956 a road had already been constructed through this connecting xinjiang with tibet and this is this aksai chin road that you are seeing this is the chinese postal map you can see 1917 you can see the boundary of jammu and kashmir as it is it is very clearly given the current status the most of it is under chinese occupation since 62 most of the part is administered as hotan county which lies in the southwestern part of hotan prefecture of xinjiang autonomous region lot of people think that it is a question between tibet and us no unfortunately this is part of xinjiang not part of tibet only some part in south and east is part of tibet and autonomous region largely uninhabited except for divided village of demchok then there is of course a military station of pla called tenchu hai then you have telangtan uh, these are military stations at a very very high altitude as you know 4890 meters now who would live there it requires enormous acclimatization but since a road passes through it they have established hotels gas stations etc where people come and stay this is karkash river where white jade stone is found which actually originates in aksai chin and goes into central asia it's a fairly a medium sized river it goes and then joins another river this is pangongso lake you all must have seen it or visited it tenchu high lake then besides aksai chin we also had territories which are now under chinese occupation and this we need to understand this is known as trans karakoram tracts these were the tracts which were beyond karakoram mountains and there were three components of it one was shakskam valley which is the area which china has given it to pakistan eh, sorry pakistan has given it to china in 63 as you know there is raskam valley which is north of it and then there is takdumbash pamir this was an area which touched soviet union in those days uh, which is uh, again now within it's an area which is surrounded by kunlun mountains karkash uh, and uh, south and broad peak k2 and gasherbom on south it's also an extremely inhospitable terrain yarkand river and shaksgam river originate here it is also under chinese occupation and is part of kashgar region of xinjiang only significant habitation here is in dafdar which is in takdumbash pamir otherwise all other areas are uninhabited dafdar is at an altitude of 3400 meters historically people from hunza used to go there and carry out seasonal cultivation that is when summer was there they would go and cultivate there and take their cattle and go there for grazing now hunza had a very troubled or a very intriguing history hunza had a dual suzerainty 
the mir of hunza or the ruler of hunza used to pay tribute to maharaja of kashmir but he also used to pay tribute to the king of china and consequently in 1899 the britishers propose that china relinquishes its suzerainty over hunza and in return hunza gives up takdumbash most of takdumbash and raspan when chinese did not respond british said that this is an accusations and as a result both these lines uh, they thereafter takdumbash and raspan is not included in indian map but both macdonald line as well as johnson ardag line included shaksgam valley in india the earlier johnson line which uh, johnson had delineated showed even raskam valley as part of india now you will see this map if you see india's map the official map today actually the boundary goes along the shaded portion this is shaksgam valley and this area on top which you are seeing from bound by this red one is raskam valley which we do not claim now but if you will see old indian maps they will invariably show you this line similarly north of this was takdumbash pamir which touch soviet union in fact people used to pay taxes to mir of hunza till 1937 uh, pandit nehru as late as 26 october 1947 had stated that jammu and kashmir's northern borders touched ussr that implied that takdumbash was part of jammu and kashmir but 60 after 62 war there was a convergence of china pakistan and in 63 uh, pakistan handed over uh, shaksgam to china as part of sino pak agreement and this part has become part of china this the last piece of territory which also belongs to us is a village called minsar which is deep inside tibet it is actually 32 miles west of mount kailash it has been part of ladakh for centuries centuries means for over 500 years it was part of ladakh in 1687 treaty of tingos gang was signed it said that minsar will remain part of ladakh revenue from this village we were used to maintain the mansarovar pilgrimage the mansarovar main pilgrimage used to go from demchok and these pilgrims used to be maintained by this this became part of jammu and kashmir as ladakh came under maharaja's rule in 1865 when johnson went for his survey he talked of minsar located beyond rudok and gartok and the revenue collected being 500 rupees per annum this is the position of minsar you can see here minsar is there and this is mansarovar kailash is here even after independence in 1950 an officer of the jammu kashmir went there and met the people and collected knew how much tax was being collected etc this report was sent to government of india subsequently when negotiations started between india and china we did not discuss minsar from 54 to 62 revenue was collected till 60s people say and subsequently we have lost it after 62 no no discussions have taken place on it it is located on highway 219 which is actually part of this i'll just briefly touch upon what is the strategic significance of chinese occupied this territory of ladakh because you'll say there nobody lives there what is the thing it's such an inhospitable terrain you need to understand that leh was the highest crossroad of the world it's been termed highest crossroad of the world by europeans in 19th century the trade worth lakhs of rupees in those days used to be carried out through leh there were six trade routes going there from there two routes used to go to eurasian heartland through yarkand two routes would go to lhasa one route would go from manali to punjab and go to iran and beyond to west asia another route would go from srinagar to afghanistan from that highest crossroads today leh has been converted as an isolated corner of india because occupation of china occupied territory of ladakh has denied india its traditional access to eurasian heartland and those of you who are in, uh, well aware with strategy geo strategy would re remember there is a mackinder's theory that whoever controls the heartland controls the world so heartland of the eurasia is actually the uh, powerful section for resource rich region which has to be controlled so china occupied territory of ladakh has also denied india its traditional spiritual space in tibet because tibet is where our spiritual space is there mansar over kailash etc that's not this is just a brief chronology how uh, ladakh has uh, been isolated i don't wish to read it out because paucity of time i know i have overshot my time so i just want to say this is the traditional silk route you can see how things would come and how ladakh played a very very important role but last point which i would like to make and very very categorical a nation does not lose its territory just because somebody else has occupied it a nation loses its territory only when it is forgotten as long as you remember as long as it remains in your subconscious mind it remains in your conscious mind it is your territory please remember the jews were 
sent out of Israel for thousands of years. But every year they would meet next year in Jerusalem. So they kept the memory of Jerusalem alive. As long as you keep doing that, you, this territory will remain yours. And we have tried to publish this book for this particular region. This was published this year only on occupied territories of Bharat. And I would request those of you with interest in it should try and read it and find answers to some of your questions which you may have.